in the last couple of weeks, I've leaned my diffuse material against the wall. I've put my light in places where the light should not be. I've leaned it up against books, not been able to use gels. So I've bounced light off of a t-shirt, hung off a lamp. I've used blue tack to attach like tracksuit pants to the side of my window to block out light because I don't have equipment, right? I don't have like professional standard equipment, but I'm still producing the images that I think I want to make and like post and use as a way of gathering my own mental visual library. Is there any value in taking the time at home to instead think about how to make these shitty rig setups in a kind of professional, more well thought out way? Or while I don't have the equipment, is it just worthwhile just me getting the images however I can? Because I'm breaking a lot of rules if that makes sense. If we go back to the practical situation, you're taking the first few steps to move beyond the average home enthusiast, as in larger sources Mm. having stepped up to uh, a more controllable fixture. I think where the next step lies isn't necessarily so much in exploring more complexity, but it is exploring that whole level of what I think of as lighting hygiene. I'm excited because I'm detecting a complete veer off into a a different rabbit hole. This is going to be another Lens Brands episode where I ask a question and then you're like, no! We need to talk about this. And then we talk about this thing for like an hour and a half. I'm excited. Please please elaborate on lighting hygiene. Once you start getting the kind of concepts that are moving us towards a bit more of a, I'm going to call it a, a ambitious contemporary style, for lack of a better term at the moment, cleaning up your lighting setups. Mm. It's kind of where you're going to see the, the biggest difference in a relatively simple lighting setup. Hence, you know, lighting hygiene. That's a very good way of kind of putting what I was trying to articulate, but also like definitely much more like focused version of that like i think that there's i have a sense that the setups that i'm making are very dirty and like i will look at the image and pour over it and be like okay less dirty than messy messy yeah yeah, that's a better better way of putting it one of the things that freaks me out about bewilders me is watching anything with like a mid to high level like a dp working on like a mid to high budget production the lighting hygiene as you put it like the control and the cleanliness and the small minute changes that are performed are still so intimidating and strange like it's just like it's that okay here's a good example there's an image from first men in black it's will smith on a park bench i don't know if Hmm. if he's alone or if he's talking to someone You've, everyone's seen the setup for that one. Yep. It is just absurd. Now, it's like I will they've... say, I will say, I'm pretty damn certain. I've been looking at it a few times. There are three or four of the bigger parts of that setup that I suspect are being readied, are on standby, or are being moved for uh, another setup coming up after, ah, or are being okay. wrapped from a uh, mm, previous. Right. But um, still, I think I'm definitely becoming more aware of lighting hygiene, as you put it thinking this the other day this is kind of i guess where we are moving back to a bit of tarantino the symptom that you should be looking for in terms of of like where you start with lighting hygiene is kill spill yeah Mm, feel still like the Tarantino movie. That's that's where all of that really intricate shaping happens. That's where like I begin to. I've only really like my experiments with stopping spill have been very very f- free form and like it's it has been a case of just like oh wait hang on putting this in this area actually does that better. There hasn't been much. I don't know if there's any academic knowledge that I could absorb about killing spill that could help me at all. But like it's still def- that's definitely like the number is a very very big step that I've yet to take. In terms of shaping light, in terms of like blocking, stopping light from going where you don't want it to go. We probably have more names for pieces of equipment and techniques than we do for modifying lights mm, there's... in terms of making it go somewhere we want it to go, if that makes sense. Flags and beards and floppies and scrims, which I think is a universal term for all of those things, and then nets, which are also scrims, but also not really. <sighs> uh, cinefoil is a part of that. That's all I can think of so far. Barn doors do that, kind of. I ain't got no barn doors. So, so yeah, your toppers, bottomers, siders, Jesus. solids, teasers, skirts, beards. Yeah, this just to kind of stop light going where you don't want it to go. You're probably going to hit the wall first. I think the next investments should be in couple assistance. That has been my number one concern for months. I've just mm. every time I've done one of my little setups, 
and then post it on Instagram. I thought to myself, boy, oh boy, my life would be easier with like two C stands. I've mm-hmm. got A clamps. I've got bed sheets. I've mm-hmm. got anything that's black works as a a flag or a. Mm-hmm. I've got all of it. I just haven't got the C stands. And again, I used a lamp, a lamp, which was just so annoying. So I'm not, I don't do that anymore. I would need to tennis ball them though, because I would be scratching the shit on my floor if otherwise. For this stage, the economy brands like Newer or those kind of brands, mm. depending on where the exchange rate is sitting, I've seen them in the last year, year and a half, down to under a hundred dollars like 98 99 dollars for a season as opposed to an avenger or a matthews that's going to run you five five fifty i think the other thing that you really want to start looking at is a roll of xenofoil mm. comparatively a small investment that's going to last you a very long time because you just reuse it right i've never seen yeah. you put a, a piece of xenofoil on the bin before like it's not a it's technically disposable but not really go for the 60 centimeter width rather than the first standard 30 centimeter width mm-hmm. price isn't that much more but because it's twice the width so like if you need bigger pieces then you've got that option Part of what I'm hearing is a mental picture of, I guess, a kind of probability calculation of like, where am I going to get spill? Yes, I, I just don't have that. <laughs> I think there are two ways of going about that. Either you cut at source. Which is what I've had the most success with in my existence so far. Or you cut as close set side as you can. And there are pros and cons right now. So let's see if this makes any sense without a visual. Have you noticed how the shadow definition is dependent on the distance between the source the shadow casting object and the surface that the shadow falls on mostly yeah i don't think i've articulated those thoughts properly but if we're talking like some kind of distance some kind of you have source and you've got surface that the shadow falls on mm-hmm. and you've got some kind of object going in between that's casting the shadow yeah the closer we are to the light source the less to find the, softer. the shadow yeah so yep. if we want a more precise more defined shadow we need to be much closer to to the surface than we are to the source. Mm. In terms of cutting light, what are we actually doing? When we're killing spill, we're creating a shadow. Yeah, all right, okay. I was overthinking that one. <laughs> so that means if we want a more precise cut, we're we have actually to be better off further away. Cutting, cutting closer to subject. Oh. So you know, huh. often when you use the barn doors, mm-hmm. and particularly if you've got quite a distance between source and subject, because you're cutting close to the source, it's not really doing much, is it? Hmm. Just give me a second to write down what we've spoken about so far before I forget. If we imagine, let's take an example like a 12 foot by 12 foot diffusion Mm -hmm. and we're using some kind of reasonably biggish fixture like i don't know 5k for now or something to light through the diffusion very often we get in that situation where like if that's the diffusion and that's your 5k there when we try and bond all things you can even see because i'm using a soft source here for Mm -hmm. it to start like stop the light from spilling around the actual diffusion because I'm so far away, can you see I have to actually cut quite far into the actual diffusion, if that makes sense, to stop it from spilling around the sides. So rather than relying on on (laughs) barn doors, like a typical go-to standard hygienic setup for Fresnel through silt or diffusion would be you have source, like the actual Fresnel, and you got two solids, two cutters either side. Ah. And that's, you know, like experience lighting crews. If you go, okay, can we push a 5K through that 12 by? They'll automatically go and grab the two cutters to side to chop the Fresnel as well, because you get better control. Because with the bigger cutters, you're cutting from a little bit further away from the fixture and closer mm. to the diffusion. And therefore it's more precise. Yeah, and more wow. content. That's one approach to it. Cutting at source, if you have that habit of always going reasonably large fixture, p- pushing through your like medium to large modifier or whatever, there's always going to be some kind of cutters on standby to go with this. Mm-hmm. And you may look at taking out the hotspot, let's say like maybe using an artificial silk rather than something like a full grid cloth. A way of taking out that hotspot would be to push the fixture through something like a 4x4 before going through the seal, for example. So then you'd end up with maybe two floppies on either side of the 4x and then two cutters.
is either side of, of the Fresnel. So every time you add something new, there's always that assumption that, yes, we're going to cut it, we're going to kill the spill, we're going to manage it, retaining it. I'm having a bit of a double take moment. What's the difference between a silk and a regular old diffusion? Because in what what what, what 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 is regular old diffusion? What is that? Roscoe? Is that what? Lee? What product? Code I'll, yeah, because I'll talking? fix that question up. What is what are you talking about when you say silk? <laughs> because whenever I use the Shot Designer app, it's all, all of my diffusion is always silk because it says that this is a silk. I've always just thought it was a word for it, like just a general all-purpose diffusion word, but I'm beginning to get the impression that is not the case. Can you consult your Bible? Uh-huh. Love my Bible. And do you have a reference to an American cinematographer magazine two-part article on diffusion called Diffusion Confusion, as well as a diffusion test shootout comparative test by look Matt for a youtube Powell. post of mass university also look for matt powell and matt jay powell. holden's okay. diffusion right. so confusion let's, let's, let's yep. yes let's just go and google that matt powell one just for a moment just mm -hmm. for the sake of it ultimate diffusion and bounce test mm -hmm. Oof, this looks handy okay so diffusion full silk water stop silk china silk full grid cloth <clears throat> half light grid cloth water grid cloth frost opal lee 410 Half white diffusion Lee 250, full white diffusion Lee 216, bleached muslin, calico, also tested as a bounce, and unbleached muslin also tested as a bounce. Bounce includes white griffalin, griffalin? It's like a Harry Potter name. Ultra bounce, which we touched, touched on before, bleached calico, unbleached calico, and beadboard. Wow, this is... God, if only I'd listened to you and read this when you suggested it to us. Wouldn't that have been fantastic? Now, Lee also has a comparison both app and function on the website between different diffusion materials. But my point mm -hmm. being, what's standard diffusion? <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have said that. I dug myself a hole when I said regular old diffusion. Yeah, it just uh, does not exist. If you just look, Google lead diffusion and have a look at their lead diffusion index. Wait a sec. Fusion index, LDI, mm -hmm. lead filters. All right. So I was going to ask, ask. Whoa. Oh, wow. It's got a thing. Of, I can. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. It's interactive. Mm -hmm. Wow. This actually leads on to a question I was going to ask. It's not super relevant. So I was going to avoid it, but now it is. After yesterday, where I found myself without a gel, I found myself bouncing my light off of a blue t shirt to generate a color. I thought to myself, why do we use gels so often when I'm getting a color by bouncing it off something? And I did think to myself, I'm losing a lot of light. Like I'm it's it's taking the F stop down a fair bit, which is probably why people don't do that. But then so do gels. So I thought, why don't people diffuse and bounce off of colored surfaces? And then just then approximately five seconds ago, I just found out that we do in fact do that. And it does actually happen on a regular basis. And there are colored diffusion materials. So if you're only bouncing for color, then you have no choice but to do soft light. Ah, right. So it's just a, right. Okay. So it's a set of and options then, then. But in an actual production environment, rather than having to carry around a multitude, a rainbow of colored surfaces. I mean, just a big folder full of very thin gels is a lot better by the sounds of it. And a white surface yep. and you get any color you want. Mm. Cutting at source, it's kind of like, Having that mentality, you can't rely on bottles, that you want to extend the cut away from the fixture mm -hmm. for more precise control. But then as you build things up, like I said, if we, for example, think that double diffuse to take out a hotspot, then you're going to get two, two stages where you need to add two cutters, and then suddenly you're up to... Four C stands, oh. just in cutters. How are you going to do some feel like? Well, let's do some bands. Okay, so in that case, we want to cut the actual fixture of that as well. There's another couple of C stands, another couple of cutters. Dirty, slapped together stuff, as, as I've been doing for the past like, month or two, potentially. Uh, now, there, there is another approach, and that is cutting set side right. rather than cutting out source. Okay. And cutting set side has the advantage of, doesn't matter how many kind of, how much complexity it is 
at the source side before it reaches the subject. Well, you have the advantage of being able to cut it only at one place rather than having to cut it a lot of every single step of modification. Now, mm -hmm. it depends a little bit on the setup. There are types of setups, for example, like one of the big challenges with the book light is how do I avoid getting any direct light, hard light, like a slash of, of, or a spill of hard light through the diffusion mm. from the fixture. Mm. But having said all that, like a lot of these problems that we ran into with managing individual fixtures and parts of the setup, if you cut it close to the set, you cut it once and it's done. Doesn't matter if it bounces over there, doesn't matter if it bounces over there because you've cut it here and all that stuff that's happening up there, all that stuff that's happening way over there, isn't going to sneak around that. So it's a slightly more like frame centric way of cutting light. Like it's just looking at the image instead of the larger picture and sort of just thinking, where can I cut it there? Is it a bit more subject focused or? So set side rather than fixture. Mm -hmm. And our basic way of thinking about it is to either think of it as top aside and bottomers or some kind of way of getting a similar behavior. He nods sagely, say, do you remember topper side is and bottom is? Well, I'm aware that those things are in reference things. to the. <laughs> I'm aware that those names are in reference to like where the flags or beards or whatever you're using to cut the light to the side. Toppers are at the top, bottomers are at the bottom. However, I can't remember if that's relative to the subject. Is that that's is it subject focused? That that terminology. I'm getting not completely. Sure that it, it, not sure that it, it's necessarily defined in that way um mostly it's a way of, of wrangling bigger sources right also relies on the whole shadow definition is tied to the distance of the shadow caster to the shadow uh, so i see that, yeah that, that's 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 that, tough that, that, that's quite the conundrum. Um, don't know that that has a name. Let's just say, let's just call it the cookie distance for now. How come? As in cookie, cucalories, that's the shadow caster, right? Wait, hang on, repeat that. <laughs> a cookie is short for cucalories. How's that spelled? C E C O L O R I S, I believe. Uh -huh. I think there's a reason it's been abbreviated to cookie because no one in the industry can spell it. Oh, oh, okay, all right. I straight up. Did it should have been called a cookie from the first place because it's literally just a cookie cutter. Like it's a little. Huh. I can't say I knew these existed. Well, I did, but like we've used them. Really. Did we call no, them I've cookies? Spoken up, yeah, I know I've spoken about them both. Trimester one, trimester three, trimester four. Whoops. There should there should be strikes for whenever that happens. Some kind of like no more cookies for you. <laughs> no more cookies. Full stop. I was just eating these. And I can't have them anymore. In order to have any hope whatsoever of wrangling a larger source, the cookie distance applies as well. Uh, you know, as we were... Now I know what you're talking about. Cookie distance. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we want to cu cut the soft source closer to subject rather than closer to source. Yeah. So often the whole topper cider bottomers business ends up kind of looking like building a pseudo wall with a window in it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Do you remember what topper, bottomers, and siders are short for? No, unfortunately. <laughs> so if we chop the top, that's just far too much effort to say. So you say, like, if we just put a topper here. So, yeah, rather than say, hey, can I see a top chop on that? Well, just say, can I see a topper? All right, can we get a topper okay. on that? I was, I was so worried it was going to be, like, way more convoluted. Like, he's gonna be, to topper is actually short for topper, gobble, globo, smosis, uh, three stick cookie board like i was just, yeah no no was top so chop is short for that oh of course i mean yeah. duh. come on that makes sense that makes sense the other one doesn't didn't but that mm. but that can you imagine sense. if i'm chopping the top if i'm chopping the bottom and if i'm chopping the sides can you see how i'm left with a window basically building the frame around the subject in the real space but you do that like just out of the actual shipping frame yeah huh. because we're putting closer to the subject that means that we can afford to be a little bit less concerned about every possible little spill further away mm -hmm. from the set. As long as that's not seen through our window, then not necessarily going to make as much difference. So can you see, like, it's kind of like an attack from both ends? Yeah. Like, on a big production, experienced crew, with enough crew and uh, equipment, you're doing both. I was about to ask, it probably makes us, like, most you're sense to do both. automatically kind of cutting at source as, and managing at source 
as well as cutting the set side. So I feel like the source side, like the direct cutting of the source works better for cutting the light as it appears in the space, like in how, how it works in the whole space. Whereas the set side part of it works better for like moderating light on the subject. That's the mm-hmm. impression that I'm getting. Cause I was, well, I mean, look, it, it, it's worth experimenting, but just kind of knowing and asking yourself, like having that option mm-hmm. rather than thinking that all cutting has to happen at source. Okay. Another thing with this as well is particularly if you're using wall or ceiling as bounds in, in some kind of book light scenario, you notice that it's almost impossible to get your diffusion close enough to the the wall or the ceiling to not get any spill around the edges. Yeah. So cutting subject side helps you cut that. Is that where there's an, there's an advantage to doing a book light less with the diffusion and the bounce completely parallel, but with the sort of 45 degree, 15 degree angle situations that way you have like a bit less spill to worry about where the two surfaces make contact. That's one situation, okay. but I'm thinking more the one where you're using a wall as the bounce yeah. and then just your diffusion isn't large enough that light is also hitting the ceiling mm. and you get that part of it sneaking above the top. And there's just generally no diffuser. convenient way to deal with that. Oh, except for set side cutting. Speaking of book lights, while we're on the subject, my number one concern with book lights is where to actually put the fixture. That's been my bane whenever I make them, um, if that makes any sense. It seems that making sure it's an enclosed space is kind of makes it difficult to put the light anywhere else. But like, no, I actually do think there's a hard and fast rule here to be actually like given to me. So I'll, I'll, I'll put this question in the bin for now, mentally. Constantly run into this problem with bouncing as well is where do you put the source? Um, sorry, the fixture so that A, it doesn't block any light mm. from the bounce, but that you aren't getting a hard light into the scene. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that is just hygiene in the setup. So use cutters to stop the direct light. Mm-hmm. Hence the the two cutters either. It's like the, the situation where you're using two cutters either side of the fixture instead of barn doors, that kind of scenario. And or if your fixture is low and you're bouncing from above, then like if that's your fixture, some kind of cutter above to stop mm-hmm. it from leaking, spilling into the set space. What's to think about? Now, the other thing that you can, this is going to take a little bit more rigging though. Mm. There are ways of kind of making things a little bit more efficient. And that is probably the first place to look at is the, the Swiss frame and variations on the Swiss frame. We've used the Swiss frame and it's just that the one time that we used that was just excellent. I loved that. That was when I was like, ah, yes, this is the the big source that we've been talking about. This is the best. Like it was, it was hard. To, it was just so cool. It was hard, I'm saying nonsense words right now, but it was very cool. Now there are ways of improving and like modifying on the the Swiss frame as well, and that's kind of for for walling it. Mm-hmm. So. Imagine like a larger floppy bounce. Are you going silent to test if I know exactly what you're talking about again? Are you sorry? Sorry, What's trying that? to figure out if I know what a floppy bounce is. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know, waiting for the the new module, the new the new level. Sorry, of the game to load. Well, I will admit I'm a little bit confused because I have heard the word floppy being used in a lighting context, but only in a cutting slash negative fill context and not bounce. What would it take to make a, a, a floppy bounce? Well, allow me to remind myself what a floppy refers to. I think it refers to something with soft material, because that hence the floppy. That might be a beard instead, actually. No, it is what I was thinking about. It's the little one with the, um, huh, I was right. It's the little one with the detachable. You sound so surprised. It's like, a, I literally, I'm so surprised. I the thing the image that I had in my mind was the correct image. I just didn't want to say it. It's a bit like a flag, but like it also has a loose piece of fabric that goes like if you, if you feel like mm-hmm. it. I think mm-hmm. so. Are there bounces that do that? There's a little white bounce. It's like or <laughs> if it doesn't exist, can you make it? I'm sure you can. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Imagine your Swiss frame, right? Yeah. So you got your bounce at you know give or take 45 degree angle, right? Mm-hmm. You got your diffusion hanging off it. Ah, we've made a book light. That's the Swiss frame. What? Wait, what? What am I talking about right now? What was the thing that we used ages ago to do the... This is an upsetting episode. We should cut right now. Okay, what was the thing? Back in the day, we were talking about um, window light and emulating yes. the effect of sunlight uh, as it bounces off of the... like, Especially like morning-ish light. 
as it bounces off the grass. So the bluish light of the sky bounces off the grass and the surrounding environment and all that stuff. We Hang on. We were talking about the milkmaid painting back in the day. And we did that big setup where it was the, it was all the, it was the set at JMC. And then we, we assembled this big frame and it was a, it was a bounce from memory. Mm -hmm. And we had two or three Fresnels with this gel that you slapped together that was like a it was a graduating from blue at the top to like reddish orange at the bottom and you pass the light through that the the bounce the big frame that we assembled was at like a 45 degree angle up a bounce off that and then bounce through the windows that's how you achieve that that particular effect what was that frame called it's not a switch so frame, was is it? it no because it didn't it only bounced yeah well i didn't know that now I know. Swiss frame. We ended up using an improvised eight by floppy bounce. Yeah. Because we had the bounce and then we had an additional bed sheet hanging off the back end as if it was oh. just a bigger floppy. Hmm. That sounds like a great... I've been bewildered so much that I've already forgotten how we actually started talking about the floppy. But like now I'm enchanted by the idea of the floppy bounce. The Swiss frame. Yes. yes. To kill <sighs> two birds in one stone with a Swiss frame, there are ways of making it so efficient that you don't necessarily have to worry so much about killing spill. Mm -hmm. So the principle of the Swiss frame is that you it's a variation of a book light, but it eliminates a frame and a stand mm -hmm. or two stands, I should say. So you got your bounce of 45 degrees. You're going to have your fixture and then rather than set a diffusion on a frame in front of the bounds it just literally <sighs> hangs off the top so can you see how that is eliminating that extra frame and stands for the diffusion yeah and it's Wait. called as yes well I, I can see that so i thought you were going to mention that it eliminates the need to cut but i will i will ask about that later continue right so it's called a swiss frame because american it looks like half of a well, of a Swiss chalet. Right. You know, the Just... peaked roofs of like European. Oh, Alpine. right. Okay. I got but you. Yeah. Like, half of it. And the Americans are just like, oh, that's so funny. We should call it the Swiss frame. What an interesting nation. Right, so if you imagine, you get the same problem here as you do with any other kind of bounce here is that you're going to get some sneaking off under that side. Yep. Right. But if we floppy that, yep. then okay. that really matter so much. And once you what understand about, that, uh -huh, what about here uh -huh. and here. Uh -huh. Am I so that's asking why, the right remember questions. Remember what I was saying <laughs> about the making that more efficient yep. by four walling. Uh, this so we're, we're actually almost. You've got your wall number one. That's the diffusion. Mm -hmm. You've got your wall number two. That's your floppy. So where do your other two walls go? Either side either side yeah and in that way you're kind of doing the same thing you're doing last time where you're just sort of. It sounds to me that provided you have the time and the resources, the best way to kill spill is by just putting a box of stuff around your source or your subject, mm -hmm. just boxing it, boxing it in. Am, am I right in the saying well, you know, that? Look, this is the typical approach to the, not so much in terms of, of cutting, but the typical approach to the dreaded white room challenge, it's just neg everything that isn't in frame. The dreaded white room challenge. Is that when you're put in a white room and everything in the room is white? We, 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 we want something method? really chiaroscuro, tenebris, and oh. similar. Here, have a white room. I like the idea that there's a white room challenge for cinematographers that is as torturous as the white room torture method. You know, the solution is just a uh, negative fill on everything that isn't in frame. Wow. Okay. Are there any, I wonder if there's any examples. Are there any movies that have had like a, ah, oh, you know what? What's the Matrix Reloaded? It has a white room in it, right? Architect. But that's kind of deliberately super blown out looking from memory. No. That's, yeah, just... that's, that's a white white psych, cyclorama. Sigh. And I'll with, with one giant softbox overhead and then probably a couple of 20 buys to give it a bit of modeling. Wow. That's so cool that you had that image. I, I had to Google it and you just had it memorized. Well, you know, it's, like, uh... if that's... I guess it, it's you're into cooking. It's like right? image. Yeah. Like in French cuisine, mm. there's the four mother sources. Not that into cooking. What's the. So, like in French cuisine, there are four sources that are considered. If you can, if you know how to make those, then you can mix a bunch and make any sauce in French cuisine. Right. So, if you're a French cuisine chef, then you kind of have to know the mother sources. Mm -hmm. So, the white side, big overhead softbox, that's kind of one of the must have uh, cinematography techniques. I'm pretty sure that's how community does it or did it back in the day. A little bit more hidden, a mm. little bit more kind of, yeah. Mm. I keep on derailing whatever topic you're trying to flow seamlessly onto next. That bird, for country. some reason. Didn't really that hear much bird. of it. 
So as per usual, we've started with fairly now invalid question where I sort of, my question about are my lighting setups valid or helpful sounds to me like instead we've unpacked it into sort of a lighting hygiene conversation, which makes a fair bit of sense to me. It sounds to me the more we focus on lighting hygiene, the more I'll understand just like the practicalities of pointing a light at something. Probably make you feel better in that regard. Killing spill appears to be the, the number one Kill spill. focus. Kill spill is the number one focus at the moment. For me, I'm that means a to the theater name. <laughs> For me, that means buying more stuff to start. Mm. C-stands. I don't think it necessarily has to be major, major. No. In the grand scheme of things, even the more budget-friendly C-stands aren't necessarily going to last as long. They're not going to be as flexible mm. in terms of what they can and can't do. Mm. But you go two, three years down the track and maybe you can afford to buy something more purpose-built then maybe yeah. you relegate the first few beginner C-stands to things like holding various pieces of props or to hold up yeah. an extra microphone or, you know, there are always uses. It'll be helpful in the long run regardless. Not really too concerned. I think with... the, the other one that we shouldn't underestimate, uh, particularly as we're moving in towards like needing to what I think of as box in larger sources. Yes. Is the painter's poles of various descriptions with some way of attaching them to, to light stands or C stands. What did you say? Painters? So, you know, the extendable poles that painters use for reaching yep. higher places on the wall? Yes. So they're my go-to for my shower curtains. Oh, okay. Bed sheets, shower curtains. I see. I see. And microphone stands, particularly for things like fabrics to cut with, because you get that arm, right? Huh. Painter's pole. Okay, I'm following. I'm following. So we've kind of unpacked the difference the sort of distant, the question of distance and the question of like placement of like cookie distance. Killing is that spill, what we did? Cookie distance. We had a whole thing about cookie distance. Me not knowing how to speak a language as per use. You know, we know that the, the cookie distance situation is that, you know, generally the further you are away from the source, the more precise the effect of the cut or the effect of like any shadow, basically, the more defined the shadow is, which is a bit ironic because if you have barn doors, you're not really going to get much of an effect from a very, very powerful source. It's very, very close to the barn doors, i.e. directly behind them. Hence, boxing things in on the camera side of the whole situation. You know, the idea of placing two flags or colors, I got to figure out my terminology still, on either side of the fixture as it passes through the source or on either side of the source in front of said source that is behind a fixture. It's a whole deal. But but for more precise subject focused cuts, you're looking at subject side cutting things like well well doing that. And then we've got toppers, siders, and bottomers, which kind of led us to our whole Swiss frame discussion and the idea of just box boxing stuff in. It sounds to me that in the end, if you can, which sounds like it not common, the best way to cut light is to just like put a box around either your source or what you're shooting. Mm. Because it, if you think about it, like the, the four wall Swiss frame that we ended up with, conceptually, how different is that to a softbox? Barely at all. But the reason why we don't use a softbox is because good luck finding a 12 foot by 12 foot softbox. <laughs> yeah. So can you see, like, we're essentially looking for our setup to do similar things to what something else is already doing, but there isn't anything existing to do it on the scale we want to do it. Build it with stuff. Mm. All comes back to the question of size of the source by the sounds of it, as usual. I think there's a there's a good subtitle for like a lot of our lighting theme discussions, which is just like lighting, colon, or the immense struggle of using larger and larger sources. Yeah. What what is that saying? <laughs> go big or go home? It's probably more like go big and never get to go home because there's so much work involved. <laughs> go big and work through lunch. Mm. Right. That sounds like a good that, go, go big and work through lunch is a great way to cut off. Yeah, so I think 